Hey, I'm David Dahl. I'm the Cooperative Extension Farm Advisor in Merced County. Uh, that's my formal area. Some of you probably see me floating around in Madera. Um, don't tell our county supervisors because they won't like that. That's Merced County gas going to Madera, right? Um, we'll pay I, your gas. Yeah. I thought uh, one thing I would... Um, there's a few things I want to talk about as we kind of go through this this kind of post-harvest or hull split to harvest to um, post-harvest period. Um, a few of them are just some reports we're hearing. We're starting to see some scab pop up on Carmel's and Padres. Uh, we're seeing some rust. It's not as bad as last year, but it is there. I get a lot of questions from people this time of year. What should we do? Can we do anything? And you, whatever you do at this point will help you sleep better, but it won't necessarily fix any problems that you have in the orchard. So if you do have a building scab population and you go out there and you try to spray a fungicide, um, you're not going to do much good knocking it down. And the reason why is you think about how these populations develop in an orchard. Back when the spray timings are set up back in May, the population, let's say, is, we'll make up a number, it's 10, right? So the population is 10, our spray cuts it in half down to five, and so when it goes into that growth cycle, it has to double from a smaller population. So remember, every epidemic is going to start off and go into a logarithmic growth. So it's going to go one to two, to four, to eight, to 16, to 32, to 64, and so on. So you, when you start and you apply that control method at an earlier time period, you reduce the number of your initial inoculum. So that ability to grow to a devastating population, it takes longer to get to that point. Um, when you come in at a later season, you're now spraying onto a population of, let's say, 3,200. So you'll cut that maybe to 1,600. But the next generation cycles all the way back up to what you did. So for the most part, you're not going to gain a lot of control by going back into an orchard later in the season, especially around now, to make an application for scab or rust control. Now you're saying, well, why am I seeing it? If I sprayed at those timings that the UC told me, the UCIPM guide told me, you guys are lying to me, you know, those, those, aren't, those aren't the right timings. Well, the reality, those are the timings that give you the most effective control based upon using the best chemistry at that time. So yes, you're gonna have breaks in control. You're gonna see a little bit. You're gonna always have a little bit of foliar disease in your orchard. You may even see a little defoliation in October, but the whole idea is to keep the leaves on these trees, and I talked about this back in our last meeting, the whole goal is to keep the leaves on the tree through the point of the post harvest where we can pull up enough water and nutrients into that tree. So really, we're looking at trying to get the leaves on probably to the first first of October. Um, having these trees green all year long, all the way through into December like this past year, is probably not necessarily a good thing in regards to reducing our overwintering disease inoculum because you have this green tissue that it's able to survive on a lot longer in the orchard. So you have more persistence. You have a larger overwintering population. Thanks, Walt. Um, so those those are some of the concerns to kind of think about when you look at this. It's all about threshold, it's about tolerance. You can't have a zero threshold. And if you can't stand seeing a disease in your orchard, go back to a 24 square planting. That's all I, I can really say. Because if you want to plant a dense orchard, 22 by 18, 22 by 16, 20 by 16, you're going to be seeing diseases. So now it comes down to managing. And when you manage, that doesn't mean eradication. That means managing. So. Always keep that concept in mind as you approach. I'm not trying to sit up here and, and um, preach, uh, be a preacher and tell you you're all, you're all gonna be doomed to a life of disease, but consider it as you walk through, and especially when you have sensitive varieties, Carmel, for example, Padre, those, those varieties are a little bit more sensitive. So you're always gonna see it pop up on those first. Um, the second thing I want to kind of see, and I've been seeing a lot in the field is, um, I, I've been seeing some gumminess on some independence, the independence variety. Actually, some of you may see the post I just put up a couple weeks ago. Um, I was in an orchard and we saw a lot of gumming coming out of the hall. And when we looked at the kernel, there was no damage. So if any of you are independence growers and you see some gumminess on your, your almonds, on your almond hulls, uh, I think it's physiological. I don't think it's leaf-footed plant bug. I think it's something to do with the development of that nut probably do with the times, the timing of the year. And I've seen it in three orchards and a lot of regional between Madeira and Merced. So I think it's something more physiological than 
disease or insect related. So I thought I'd clarify that in case you're anybody seeing that um, in, in the crowd or maybe you haven't looked yet. Uh, the next thing I kind of want to carry on is, is we are probably in this area well on the hall split when we talk about non -parel. Um You know, we, we talk about a dry down for a reduction of hull rot and it's probably a little bit late and probably for non -parel, but in general, the way we look at that, it's, it's better to maintain your same frequency of irrigation, but reduce that duration of irrigation. So let's say as we go into hull split and we get that suture development, and we kind of fit our thumbnail into it, we want to cut the water anywhere between 30 and 50%. That's a time. So let's say you irrigate for 20 hours. We At that point, we'd probably be putting on anywhere from 10 to 14 hours instead of 20 hours but we're still irrigating once a week. Does that make sense? So we maintain the same frequency, but we cut the duration. We wanna make that cut, we're gonna probably cut maybe 30% the first week, probably come into the second week, maybe cut a little harder, um, 40 to 50%. And then usually that third week, we can go back to a 30% cut up to maybe a full irrigation to bring those trees back up to a full, full irrigated water as we approach for harvest. We kinda of go into harvest, We'll then cut that irrigation again, um, not necessarily completely, but again, we'll cut some percentage off in order to dry those trees down for harvest. Why do we not want to cut the water completely between the period of hull split and harvest? You know, a lot of that is you're going to dry down your kernels, so you're going to lose money. Um, what we know is when we cut water after hull split, the tree will pull moisture out of that kernel. And yeah, you do need to get your kernels to a certain weight. To, it's usually six to eight percent. Um, but in general, if you dry them down too much, you'll be losing money. So that's why we want to bring those trees back up to full irrigation. You cannot force hull split by cutting water at the hull split timing. If you want to force hull split, cut water back in May and June. You'll get a, you'll get an earlier hull split. But the problem is, you cut it back there, you're going to lose kernel weight as well. So last year. We had this really elongated hull split. You guys probably remember, it seemed like it took forever and ever and ever. It's like, what's going on here? A lot of people dried their trees down. They're like, well, I'm waiting on split and I'm just gonna cut the water and keep the water off completely. That's not the way to force a split. It's a natural progression of the nut. If, if you keep your trees over water, generally over water, split will be later. If you underwater your trees, generally split will be earlier, but that's everything earlier in the season not at the timing of hull split. Does that make sense? I just kind of want to go through these things that kind of keep coming up in questions um, that we deal with. Now, the, the last thing is, is kind of referring to um, when what's the earliest time we can actually get nitrogen back on these trees? Because our big concern is bud development for next year. So we got a nice crop on these trees. Uh, we're looking at it and it's like great we got a next nice crop but what about next year we want to get we want to prevent this we want to make sure we're not going up and down on a kind of an alternate bearing pattern so we do know that once as that nut prepares for harvest essentially what happens between this peduncle and and the nut is you start getting the formation of, a, of an abscission layer so between here and the nut that abscission layer begins with the kernel. If you actually open up the split nut and scratch off the pellicle, you'll see at kind of the navel or the belly button of the nut, you'll see it start to turn brown. That's kind of the beginning process of this abscission point. So at that point, you're, you're getting that abscission to form between the kernel, but the hull is still connected. The next step is the, the, the hull itself will begin to abscise from the peduncle. So when you're at that point, that's the timing that the tree will no longer be putting in water, be putting in nutrients into the hull. It'll be going into the tree. You're thinking, well, that's easy to do from you know the ivory tower standpoint of just telling us when to do it. What's a good field identification aspect of this? When these holes split and you see them start to dry down, the actual hull starts to shrivel, that's a good indication. That means the tree is, the hull is no longer pulling water out of the tree. It's no longer to stay fully, fully irrigated or fully imbibed, so it starts to shrivel. That's a nice indication that you say, okay, that's the earliest time I can go back in and apply some nitrogen to the tree and it's not going into the hall, it's going into the tree. You may be thinking, well, why, why are we in such a rush? And you know, that's a lot earlier than what anybody's telling me. And it's true, that's gonna probably come about a week or so before harvest, especially of non-parel. 
Um, why, why were, I should add that if you do, if you do go in and irrigate at that point, you're probably not going to irrigate a full 100% ET. You're probably going to go like a 50 to 60 to 70% of ET at that time in order to kind of keep those trees gradually drying down for harvest, which I'll get there in a minute. So why, why are we concerned about getting nitrogen and water on at that time? Again, bud development. Bud development for non prel happens about, you know, it's, it's somewhere around uh, two weeks after harvest. So on a, on a given average year or normal year, whatever that may be, but we're usually happening about 10 days to two weeks after harvest. Bud development for Carmel is about two weeks before harvest. Well, Carmel goes about a month later harvesting roughly than non prel So coincidentally enough, they come about the same time. So think about that as that bud development happens for all the varieties in your orchard, from what we understand, from what we've researched we've done, happens about two weeks after the harvest of non perel in a given harvest year. Last year, where it was cooler, things probably shifted a little bit later, um, but this year, you know, by far we're probably looking at about a two, two weeks after harvest that we're getting that bud development. So we want to make sure the tree has its water, it has its nutrients, and Probably in most cases we're going to put that on before we harvest because we get in the rush of harvest and it's hard to get the nuts off the ground, get the water on, etc, etc, etc. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about is this drying down for harvest. Do we have any custom harvesters in the crowd? Alright, so you, you'll probably be interested in, you probably know this and you'll probably correct me, which please do. Um, you probably heard the report that maybe you have heard the report that we can water the trees a hundred percent ET and we will not get any shaker damage. Is that true? They water full ET, will you, will you guarantee no shaker damage? Well, it depends on what it's like when you put the shaker in the field. Yeah. So I, what I was getting at is, is yeah that may be true in a perfectly controlled environment of a UC study but I will tell you if you walk into this field and you look at how much water is coming out of this emitter here to the emitter at the end of the run, you're going to get a lot of variation just due to the pressure changes and the distribution uniformity across the field. So you may be delivering 100% ET to this tree here, but 30 trees or 15 trees down the road, it may be getting, well excuse me, the tree 15 trees down the road may be getting 100% ET, this one may be getting 150% ET. And now that bark's swollen, it's, it's wet, he comes in and shakes it, he's going to bark that tree. He's not, you're not going to be happy and he's going to not be happy and not want to shake your trees anymore. So you can keep your trees irrigated. You don't necessarily need to cut them off cold turkey, but the idea is let's step down from that percentage of ET and you probably want to give it a good, you know, give it a, a, some dry down period before he walks into your orchard and brings that equipment in for compaction and other purposes. So you don't want him coming into a wet orchard, definitely. But you don't necessarily want to say no more water for two weeks before harvest. That's more of a flood flood tactic when we used to flood irrigate it. But now we're on these micro irrigation systems. You know we're all we're kind of riding on that heel of a mild stress at any given point. You know in, at this time since there's no deep moisture and we're kind of going playing this ET game where we're cutting water, adding water, cutting water, adding water. So that's a consideration to make is is you don't necessarily need to say no water for two weeks to my trees because I'm getting ready to harvest. It'd be better to go, okay, we're just gonna cut the duration, apply the relative same frequency, but we're gonna make sure we're not walk coming into a wet field. Would disagree, agree, no? I mean, yeah, as long as it's not wet. As long as it's not wet, yeah. So keep that in mind. If you have a custom harvester, talk with them a little about it. If you're doing your own harvesting, well, you know, if you keep it too wet, you only have yourself to blame, right? If you bark trees, and you can, you can yell at me too, that'd be fine. Um, but that would probably be the happy medium just because there's no guarantee of even, it, even irrigation distribution uniformity across the field. You know, to give you an idea, I'm working with a really well-engineered system up in northern Merced County, and uh, we're doing this irrigation experiment. And we went out there and they said, oh, everything's gonna be uniform, it's gonna be a great system. We walk out there, it's supposed to be a nine gallon per hour emitter. We're getting 12 on one end, we're getting six on the other, and they're all compensated. So they're all supposed to be given the same pressure. The reality is, no systems even. And 
That's probably why sometimes you see some lagging and leading ends depending upon your irrigation system. Unless it's really, unless you really spend a lot of time to dial it in. And we'll always give the caveat to the person who spends a lot of time figuring it out. So I thought those were some quarter cultural practices to bring in. And as we kind of roll into the post harvest period, um, you probably heard the rule of thumb. We're generally looking at a probably 70, 30 to 80, 20 split of nitrogen between the in season and post harvest application. When we say post harvest application, that's when we start, we go back to this abscission layer forming. So that 30% or 20% starts with that first application you're making to get nitrogen on the trees in the quote post harvest period or actually post abscission layer forming period of the tree. So this is when the, there's no crop draw on the tree. You're applying this nitrogen to the tree when there's nothing, when the crop is not gonna pull it out. So that's the idea, Kip? Well, how, what's the percentage? Because you're not gonna have 100% abscission. And so then, you know, you have to use, or? I would probably say if you're seeing 50%, most, if you're seeing 50% of the hull start to dry down, you're probably at 100% abscission somewhere. I mean, close to it. Close. close period there because then pretty soon you're gonna get natural fall. Yeah. If you have micro sprinklers, you can water the net. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, like I said, we're the ivory tower. We present the information. You guys make it practical, right? So wait a minute. I'm supposed to be the farmer, guys. I'm supposed to make it practical. But you know, a little bit. It's a little bit somewhere <laughs> a happy medium. And to be honest, if your trees are coming into this period well fertilized, you're somewhere around two and a half percent on your mid July leaf samples you're probably not as critical to get nitrogen on in this period. But if you're short, you're coming in a little under because you had a heavy crop load or you got behind or you know you got lazy. Um, you know what happens, went on vacation um, at the end of May and didn't get that last nitrogen application on. You know, you could probably use this as a little bit of a catch up period. So if I, if I looked at a leaf sample mid-July and I was sitting around 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, I'd probably just wait to after harvest. But I was sitting around 2.0, 2.1, 2.2 on that lower threshold, I'd probably be a little bit more antsy to get some nitrogen on these trees. And a lot of that has to kind of go back to what Patrick Brown has been showing. There's a lot of variability in nitrogen across this tree. You may have 2.2% or 2.5% in this leaf here, but it may be 2.1% up there. So generally we're, if you're on the higher end, you got a buffer. If you're on the lower end, you're probably a little bit more antsy. So going back to, that, that probably puts a little bit more precedence on getting the, the nitrogen on. So going back, so 30%, 20, 20 to 30% of your annual season's nitrogen budget going on in a post-harvest period. Why? Well, really, we can't deliver much more than that because we're probably gonna be irrigating maybe one or two more times, maybe three times, depending on the weather. Um, but we need this tree to have leaves. This tree does not have leaves. You're not getting adequate uptake of that nitrogen into the part what's developing the buds and we'll have the, the fruit wood for next year. So if you're completely defoliated after harvest, I, I, you're not gonna get much good out of making an application of nitrogen. If you're completely defoliated after harvest and your trees relieve, relief, that's bad news. You'll, your trees are gonna be healthier, but they're not gonna have a lot of crop next year. So. Um, generally, we want to get that on as soon as we can after the harvest of our, our pollinators, get the water onto the trees, get them up and going. Um, we do lose a lot of leaves during harvest. That's normal. Um, these trees are desert trees. They know when to start dropping leaves, and most of them tend to be interior. Okay, so now we're in the post-harvest period. Um, let's say we had some rust problems this year. Uh, as we approach late October, early November, we want to get these leaves off the trees. So even if the weather is nice, like last year, beautiful 65, 70 degree days in late November uh, or late October, and the trees are green as can be, we want to do what we can to start knocking the leaves off. And a lot of that comes down to making a heavy application of zinc sulfate. So we're looking around, you know, 25, 30 pounds per acre. You don't get a clean drop when you do this, but it helps drop the leaves. And what happens is that's a salt. So you're spraying that zinc sulfate onto this tree it's causing those leaves to burn, form an abscission layer, and drop off. It's no different than if you went and dumped too much nitrogen on and it, during a hot week and a tree sucked it all up at once, or chloride, or potassium thiosulfate, or, or any of that, and the leaves drop. It's a sim very similar response to what we're trying to do. We're trying to form an abscission layer by dumping on salt. Um, zinc sulfate is a good salt to use because it provides zinc 
to the soil, not so much to the tree, zinc to the soil, but also the sulfate will help, you know, provide sulfur as well. So that kind of brings segues way into this post-harvest foliar spray practice. Um, I know I was confused at one point, and you may have heard me said that, hey, in that 25, 30 pounds zinc sulfate spray, we can dump in everything we want and we'll get it into the tree. And so I said, you know, something doesn't seem right about that. So I called Patrick Brown, I called Ken Shackle, I called a lot of the physiologists, and they said, Dave, you're wrong. So I apologize to any of you I've told that to. Um, I was wrong. It happens when you're young, <laughs> I hope. Fewer and fewer as you get older. But anyways, I was wrong. What happens when we put that zinc sulfate on, it creates that excision layer forms relatively quickly probably within 12 hours of that application. It may take longer for those leaves to drop, but it forms relatively quickly. When we apply nutrients to the tree, generally you do get your most uptake within that first day, but you do get a lingering uptake based upon the concentration that's in the leaf. So imagine uptake is more like a curve like this. So time on the bottom, amount on the top. So we wanna look at, in that post-harvest period, an application of boron um, for the next year, so we don't have to go back through and dormant. An application of boron, if you're short on zinc, put some zinc in. Some people go through and apply a little nitrogen. Um, some people go in and sling on a lot of micronutrients. But really, I put a lot of emphasis on putting on boron. And you're saying, why? Because generally, we're pretty low on boron. And even if you're adequate, based on your hull analysis, even if you're adequate, we still see a yield bump by applying boron in the post-harvest period. So, Two pounds of solubor, or two pounds, yeah, roughly about pound, a half pound to a pound of solubor. We're not going too crazy. So for the, as Roger Duncan always says, for the cost of a burger and fries, you can increase your, your per acre, you can probably get about another, you know, 50 to 100 pounds out of your trees. So we can put that on in a post-harvest period. That reduces um, the need to go back through and dormant or spray boron at pink butt. And the reason why I like going in post-harvest period, well, besides the fact that it may cut into your vacation time, which is well deserved at that point, um, but that putting boron on at any other time in a dormant, you lose the ability to catch it. Think of how much surface area that's on this tree when you think of these leaves. So when these leaves are off this tree, you now only have the wood to catch the foliar spray. So that's why we generally get uh, I feel we get more adequate uptake in the fall. Well, actually, researchers are we get more adequate uptake in the fall. The, the other reason I like it is because people say, oh, I forgot to put boron on. Now I'm going to put it on, and it's pink, pink bud. At pink bud, the application of boron at pink bud, it's okay. But if it gets a little, the tree progresses a little bit past pink bud, so maybe you're a little bit late or you're coming in targeting one variety, we have shown that boron applied after pink bud will decrease your almond yield. So that's why I'm always a little bit gun shy. I'd rather see it go on in the fall so you don't have to sit there and question, am I a pink bud? Am I a little bit past pink bud? You know, where am I at on these trees? So consider that as, as a, an additive to your tank. Um, I do have the rate on, on the blog as well um, if you look for post-harvest post, uh, boron applications. Um, as far as disease pressure, as we come into this point, um, we're drying, you know, we talked about drying down the halls for, uh, to kind of even up hall split. That was also for a hall rot control. That's probably gonna be the primary disease that's gonna pop up in your orchard. Uh, hopefully it doesn't catch you by surprise. We've been having a little bit drier of a year this year, so hopefully it won't be as bad as last year. Um, but if you see any black, black mold coming out of the split open of your halls, um, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at hall rot. Some things you can consider if you're really nervous about hall rot, um, you can dump in a fungicide <coughs> at pretty much the same time you would apply your Intrepid spray, so when you can kind of fit your thumbnail in that suture, that's the, pro that's the, the best timing for hall rot control with a fungicide. Now, do I think it's a great thing to do? No. Is it a Band-Aid on a system? Yeah. Um, so always try to manage it with a cultural practice. The other thing is, you're going to see more hall rot on your non-perel. So you're not going to see it necessarily as much, you're not going to really see it much on Carmel, 
you'll see maybe a little bit on your Monterey. Non-Prel has the worst issue with hull rot out of most varieties we plant. So that's kind of where you know the issue really comes. You see it on your, your non-prel, you get worried, oh I need to spray my other trees, don't worry about it. Most likely it won't pop up on those trees. And I think a lot of it has to come to is how we dry the trees, how we prepare the trees for harvest. And I think that affects the way Carmel and Monterey, I think it dries down that hall and makes a less conducive environment for the pathogen. And Everybody says, well, what can I do sanitation-wise to clean up uh, the orchard for hall rot prevention? And I wish I could tell you a thousand things because sanitation is always the best way, uh, best defense when you talk about you know, pest management, pest and disease management. But the reality is it's a bread mold. It's found everywhere. If you make homemade bread, you put it on your kitchen counter, the same black stuff you see growing on your, your bread is the same stuff that's in that hall. Your, your house is relatively clean, I hope. Mine isn't, but I hope. And so, you know, you kind of you look at it in that consideration. Is you can't do much to eradicate it from the orchard. So that's, that's some other concern or things to keep in mind. It comes down to culturally trying to manage and dry down that hole, and in severe cases coming back through and um, making those applications. So that was kind of my spiel. Um, any, any thoughts, comments? Kick me in the rear end. Something I said wrong. Yeah. Uh, what do you do when you know, I tom grill for thing on the hull rot, but have alderage that are about two weeks later than tom grill, and they get it just as bad as tom works? Yeah. So the question is, what do you do when um, when you have alderage and non perel And again, you know, I think as you approach this, I mean, I guess you're not really, you're probably past the point of approachment. But you probably want to take the same, um, how would you manage Hall Rod and Aldrich was kind of the, the flip side question. When you have, it's a pretty close stacked harvest to non -parallel. it's maybe two weeks separation. Um, when you look at Aldrich, and you're going to apply that same strategy, is when you start, can fit your fingernail in there, you want to cut that water. And, and everybody says, well I don't like cutting water at that time because 10 minutes ago, or maybe it was 20 minutes ago, you told me if I cut the water and put, after a hull split, I'm going to dry, dry down my nuts, I'm going to lose kernel weight. So if I cut them now, I'm going to get more stick tights and on and on and on. The, the thing is, is cutting the water is not a complete removal. It's a reduction of water to apply a stress. You want to apply a moderate stress. And the reason is, as this tree stresses, it starts pulling moisture out of this hole. And that moisture, when that opens up, think of it as uh, an environment that's full of sugar and, and you know, protein. It's the perfect conducive environment, and it's humid because it just split. It's the perfect microclimate for a fungus. So the whole idea is we try to draw out a little bit of that moisture, a little bit of that nitrogen through a moderate, an application of moderate stress. That's about the only thing I, I, I would probably would think would work for an Aldrich is, is the same strategy just applied to that variety. Um, yeah, maybe also probably if you cut your water, um, to non perel as you irrigate your non perel and you cut the whole, you know, 20, 30 percent curtailment to 50 percent going into hull split across the whole orchard, it might help alleviate some of it as well. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those things where you might have to apply that strategy again for a second round. And I will say that this is not an eradication of hull rot by cutting the water; it reduces the amount of hull rot you'll see in your orchard. The experiments that we've done with cutting it, just general management practices, uh, we see probably 15% of the hull rot. So let's say you have 100% and then the, the control, like no treatment, and the RDI treatment, we're getting about 15% of the levels we're seeing in 100% treatment. So you do, it's not, a re, it's not a removal, it's just a reduction. To answer your question, sir, I wanna make sure I... Yeah, just got it. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I, I, when when you when you think about your orchard layouts and some of these, you know, your newer plantings, there is there is an advantage to segregating out your irrigation for your varieties, especially if you're running, you know, double line drip or my, you know, of course micro sprinkler, but you know, I know it is a little bit more expensive but it provides a little bit more freedom for you to make these, these management choices as you go into these varieties coming up. 
And Aldrich, you know, it was, it's a good variety, but it, the amount of acreage that's going in with Aldrich is, it's kind of a little bit unprecedented. You know, we, we it's been more of a northern variety because that's where Tom, Tom Aldrich developed it. So it's been kind of more of a Sacramento Valley variety. So as the acreage continues to expand, we start seeing problems. And Hall Rot's probably, it sounds like based on your experience, it's one of them. And, you know, it's the same caution I give to anybody who's planting a new variety is, as the acreage expands, we start seeing problems. So, um, doesn't mean we can't manage them, but you know, there's problems. Yes? David, you mentioned zinc as far as uh, after harvest. But is it beneficial hull split spray? Is it better to put it on hull split spray or after harvest? You know, that's a that's a good question. And, and to be honest, my guess would be as long as you have this that abscission layer forming with zinc, I'm not so worried about it going on into the nut. I do worry about boron. So zinc can go on with the. Let's say you're putting five pounds of zinc out or something per acre. You can put that on with your hull split spray. I don't have any problem with it. But in regards to boron. I do worry about boron because if this hull is not completely upsized, the boron is a hog. I mean, the hull is a boron hog. It will take everything from the tree. So all those applications of boron you put on and, and during the season, you think it's going into the tree? Well, it's going into the tree, but it's getting redirected to the hull. And so that's why, you know, we look more towards that post-harvest period when we truly have an abscission layer formed between this nut and the tree. So that's when we want to get that boron on after the nut has been removed to make sure it goes to the buds, it goes into the wood. So I answered your question and then added some. Is that I answer it? <laughs> just want to make sure I'm not uh, dancing here. If you're showing a little deficient, so you want to put some on. Yeah. That's why I was asking for better off hull split or just wait till I I think you can put it on a hull split. I think you can put zinc on almost any time of the year. You're, that's more of a, it's more of a, a nutrient for the leaf development, not so much for the kernel and, and, um, you know, you always see your zinc deficiency in your new growth. And so the, the one thing to keep about, if you have a zinc deficiency coming into bloom, that's probably not a good thing. But in late season, your zinc deficiency is not gonna affect your kernel as much as it's probably gonna affect your new growth, which will eventually affect your downstream fruit bud development. So anytime you can get it on, I think is fine. And foliar sprays, if you're on Nemigard, you're really gonna be limited to foliar sprays. Nemigard does not pick up zinc very well from the soil. You have a little bit more luxury with the peach almond hybrids, but really when we look at these micronutrients, as much as I hate saying spray foliar sprays, they, uh, it is a really good way of getting uh, micronutrients into the tree. It's just hard to get 250 pounds of N into the tree by spray rate. David, I just, I didn't have a question, but after you're done speaking, I'm gonna show, uh, go into here and, and show you that uh, young terminal with the, what I think is named our Oriental Fruit Bot in it. So if anyone wants to come after Dave's talk, we'll be, I'll be here at this tree. Any other questions? You guys can't let me off this easy. <laughs> yes? Is anybody doing any more research with, in relationship to that 10-line June beetle that is causing problems for some people in some areas? So the question is about 10-line June beetle. You couldn't let me go that easy. Um, <laughs> The, the short answer is yes. Um, they're looking more towards kind of respiration and, and determining levels of control. But the long, long story short is we, we don't really have a, a feasible solution besides pre-plant fumigation with Telone 2. Um, even then, that's no guarantee of eradication. Um, I feel for you. That's, that's a problem, and it's, it's a hard one to deal with. So we're working on it. Um, Liz, Elizabeth Fickner in Tulare County is working on it with uh, Marshall Johnson. So that's, that's kind of where I know they're looking at trying to determine um, if you can do a flood, flood drought irrigation cycle to reduce larval, larvae survivability. Um, but I, I haven't seen the most recent up-to-date up results on that. Any other thoughts, comments? All right, well, thank you guys for your attention. I appreciate it, as always.